Hi there. Welcome everyone who's here. Just to check here. We've got people in the room. Give me 30 seconds. Let a few people show up. It's jumping. That's awesome. There we go. They're coming in. Let a few more trickle in for a minute. Just make sure that my intros go well. Take a second. All right, we're past 20. I feel like that's healthy. All right, everybody. Hello, my name is Gregory. I work at the San Francisco Public Library in the Magazines and Newspaper Center. Um, our department to set this program up today. I'd like to thank Jesse Vasquez and Yukari Kane for joining us this evening. They're gonna give a great presentation. I have some announcements to go through first and then we'll get into our program. This discussion on journalism, coming out of prisons, is part of a larger cohort of programs around this year's One City, One Book, which is titled Ear Hustle. The book title comes from Podcasts, which was the first podcast created and produced entirely within the prison. It has since been globally lauded for the rare access and perspective it contributes to the conversation around it. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the program coming up this Thursday, which is in person at the main library, and also streaming online. So the authors of Ear Hustle, Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods, will be speaking uh, Thursday, November 3rd, 6 to 7.30 p.m., Tourette Auditorium, and it's gonna be at the main library again, and it will also be streaming if that's how you prefer to, to join programs. Um, it's a not to miss evening with Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods in celebration of their book, This Is Your Hustle. Moderator Piper Kernan, is the author of the book, Orange is the New Black. Books will be available at the event. The door is open at six, the event starts at six. So that's a picture of books. Sorry, I didn't transition so well earlier with that. And this is a, some information about the program coming up this Thursday. And the last thing we'll do real quickly is I'll read an abbreviated version of the land acknowledgement. This is text developed by the American Indian Cultural District and it's read at our library commission. So again, I'm gonna read an abbreviated text but the full text is there on the screen. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homelands of the Romaitish Ohlone peoples who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional home. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytish people. So we can get started with the program. As we see from a podcast like Ear Hustle, people are interested in stories about the lives of imprisoned people, and there are organizations working hard to get their voices out to the general public. Prisons are a tightly regulated environment, and I think we're all gonna learn a lot tonight about what it means for journalism to be done in those spaces. It's my honor to introduce you, Kari Kane and Jesse Vasquez. I'll give short intros, and I'll let them say more about their history as they go on. So Jesse is executive director of Friends of San Quentin News, an organization dedicated to elevating the voices and potential of the incarcerated by developing and supporting incarcerated run media projects, such as the San Quentin News and Forward This Productions. Quick note, we received the paper San Quentin News at the main library, and you can ask for it on the fifth floor. We also get copies that we distribute for free on the floor as well. So if you're, if you're here on time, you can get one of those. Yukari, is a founder and executive director of Prison Journalism Project. She's an author, educator, and veteran journalist with 20 years of experience. She was a staff writer and foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and Reuters. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for coming here. And Jesse and Yukari know each other well, so I'll let them, we're gonna let them have a discussion with us. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, Hi, I, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Yukari Kane, and um, as Greg said, I'm uh, 
actually the the CEO. We just had a title change um, and a, and a co-founder for a prison journalism project. And um, Jesse and I go way back. In fact, he is um, part of the inspiration for PJP. I don't know if you knew that, Jesse, but he was literally one of my first students. Um, the I, I can't remember five or six years ago when when I started teaching at San Quentin News and and um, and he was um, he was a star student, uh, kicked ass, getting a story published in um, it was the Washington Post. We got a story published in the Washington Post and really showed me the potential of um, journalism inside and and why it's important and. Um, and um, and look where you are now. Um, so, uh, I I thought we would start. Um, you know, since 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 San Quentin News is kind of um, you know is part of at least my my half of the inspiration for uh, Prison Journalism Project. It makes sense to start with San Quentin News and and what you guys do and and um, and then what Friends of San Quentin News is. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Yukari. Yeah, it's always great, you know, to, when we get a chance to catch up and talk to our community of supporters. So uh, I'm actually grateful for uh, the San Francisco Public Library uh, hosting this evening. Uh, it's, for me, San Quentin News uh, was kind of like a lifeline, you know, gave us purpose, you know, for a lot of the incarcerated. It was one of the only outlets of news that we had that actually spoke to like our community needs. For the most part, all of the general news that we were getting wasn't specifically towards our needs. So it was like community based journalism for us. And, you know, we print and distribute within all of the California Department of Corrections, as you know, and the Journalism Guild, you know, is our farm team. And it was great just having you teach, you know, some of the cohorts there for a couple of years. And, you know, since then, you know, we've continued to grow and the guys continue to learn and we still have the same manual that we had back then. <laughs> awesome, you know, just to be able to continue that legacy um, and continue to make a difference for our communities. So one of the things that we focus on is just providing news that's relevant for the incarcerated on policies, you know, um, rehabilitation opportunities that exist even within the confines of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And then we also have like the Journalism Guild training of future writers to have on staff at the San Quentin News. And for me, Friends of San Quentin News, um, you know, I got promoted to executive director almost a year ago to the day. And it's been a great adventure, you know, trying to build out this uh, organization to help support other incarcerated run media programs across the state. And then when the opportunity arises, you know, um, in other states as well. And it's just, great to actually know that we're finally getting you know some of those voices out you know from behind the walls yeah yeah for sure um and um and as jesse mentioned um the way i got into it is um is that i started teaching journalism um inside for san quentin news i'd been a business reporter for about 15 years covering technology covering um, apple and steve jobs and and really uh, some of the, the the wealthiest people and companies um in the world and um i I moved away from that, uh, got into teaching, and then uh, one day I got an email uh, saying that San Quentin News was looking for a teacher, and it just really appended my perspective. Um, I had never covered criminal justice. Um, I never knew anybody who was incarcerated, and so it was, you know, I still remember that first um, that first visit. Um, you guys were, were, were very kind. Um, and, um, but it really opened my eyes right away to A, the, the drive and the ambition in there, um, the stories that were inside that, you know, that all these issues that people outside care about from, you know, poverty and urban education um, to, um, you know, the mental health issues, um, the the war on drugs, all of that is so intricately connected to incarceration. And, um, and, and um, there were amazing stories um, inside and um, it really hit me that um, you know I'm not the right person to to do them 
and um, and that my you know that the role I could play here is to support um, through editing, through um, you know the network um, that I've built up in my career, um, and uh, and um, and also the experience that I have as a teacher. And so that was the origin um, for a prison journalism project. To um, you know, most of our work is done through correspondence because uh, we're a national organization. Our goal is to um, to make space for writers, particularly in places that don't have a San Quentin News, don't have those opportunities. Um, and, um, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, we've published over 1,500 stories from uh, over 500 writers across the country. Um, I think we're at about 37 states right now. Um, and so, um, no, I, I, I really, you know, you, you guys aren't just the inspiration, but, um, you know, I feel like, you know, it's, it's complimentary and the problem of criminal justice is so big that it takes all of us, um, including your hustle yeah. to, um, you know, to, to, to shed light in a way that, that starts to, to make a, a dent. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, I'm wondering if you could, um, you know, explain a little bit about how journalism, how how SQN makes journalism happen inside the prisons. Yeah, it's uh, it's not as easy now that I'm out on the outside. You know, having been editor in chief and operating within the confines of you know the California Department of Corrections, we do have a lot of flexibility, but there's nowhere near the amount of resources that I have now. Like one of the things that we took for granted was the fact that we have a lot of volunteers, you know, who help do our mm-hmm. source materials and do our research for us and things like that. So for us, journalism has always been like slow. <laughs> it's like, you know, one of those things where it's on a timely thing. We only print once a month, you know, and even that, you know, can sometimes be a challenge because we have to be very methodical in how we approach a story. We have to be very intentional with what we cover because we only have 24 pages to cover it in. Mm-hmm. And then we want to make sure that like our stories, you know, serve the community um, both in and outside of the prison system. But having like to work with no internet, no access to computer, no access to a phone line, you know, it makes it, you know, that much more rewarding when we do print a good story. And it makes it that much more challenging to actually go through the process, you know, just a fact checking, getting the sources right, Mm -hmm. getting the right quotes and then having the right editors put their eyes on it. And, you know, for us, it's uh, always um, a collaboration between like our volunteers, our advisors and, you know, the writers inside being able to, you know, lean on them for like fact checking and sources and also helping out with the editing and, you know, giving it a second or third glance sometimes. So it can yeah. be very slow. And just so um, everybody knows, I wanted to to help explain how I mean how really amazing um, the work is um, that the staff there does to put the paper together. Because you know, what do you do um, in a situation where there's no internet? I mean, you have volunteers who bring in the source material, which is often other articles, um, ideally primary source materials, right? And then they use that to write the stories and then what it goes through three layers of editing yeah like that about right. three layers yeah yeah so it's uh it's pretty amazing just to like think that i mean we did our story for the washington post what we went through like seven edits yeah you know, like, <laughs> it was like it got to the point where it's like leave my writing alone you know but it yeah. was great that the story came out better but i think a lot of those safeguards have to do with more like journalistic ethics than they do with like security sometimes. You know, I think one of the things I never ran into the issue of censorship with uh, the Department of Corrections. We had stories that may have been questioned because of like, well, did you take all sides into consideration, right? Like objectivity was one of the big things, right? Especially if you're writing about incarceration and you're incarcerated, then you can be opinionated or editorializing can become a danger. So, you know, we've always had that issue where we have to tread lightly on, you know, ourselves just being mindful of like, okay, are we being as objective as we can? And are we getting the facts right? Or are we getting it twisted? And fact checking a story of like, it's easy to fact check an event because, you know, you know, it happened, you know, who was present and stuff like that. But then there's also like the prison rumor mill and wanting to write a story about that. It may be juicy and attractive, but it may not be true. 
or right. all the way through. Yeah. Um, I know that everybody's going to be interested in, in in the question of censorship, but before that, I, I do I did want to chime in with um, a comparison in terms of the way that PJP works, mm -hmm. um, which is that you know as 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 uh, I mentioned, we are uh, we work completely via correspondence, sometimes through the private electronic messaging system um, that is not connected to the internet, but connected to people's uh, prison IDs, um, and then occasionally via phone and um, and so for us um, right now, the, the first step is that, uh, you know, we people submit stories. Um, we have a writing prompts and extensive writing prompts um, that gives them a start and they submit stories. We get them transcribed if they need it. Um, we have volunteers do a first line of editing. We do a staff edit. Uh, we do what we call a top edit uh, by a senior editor. Um, it goes to copy editing and then we, um, and then I take a look at everything that goes out before we put it on the website and um and you know our biggest challenge has been that that dealing with stories from all across the country you know every every prison um every state has different rules um you know bill keller who's our um the chair of our board of advisors and and the the founding editor of the marshall project recently came out with a book called um what's prison for and in it he says that if you've been to one prison you know about one prison and so um you know how do you work with writers from 36 states and make sure that we're not breaking any rules or endangering people and um and that's always a challenge um you know and and with the issue of censorship for example we you know we've 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 done a lot of research and um one of the things, you know, our understanding is that, yeah, that um, people who are incarcerated have First Amendment rights. They can write what they like, but depending on the state, the the consequences can, um, there are consequences because people inside are not free of body. And so there's a lot of, between that, that right and the fact that they're incarcerated, there's a lot of, um, you know, potential uh, reprisal that can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, San Quentin, I think, is, is, I think it would be safe to say that it's the most progressive prison in the country for for all its um, issues, and especially in terms of the media center. And I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how that approval process and uh, whether you've ever seen or witnessed or experienced, um, you know, Sacramento stepping in. Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, censorship is one of those things where, it can either be state, you know, like administered, right? Or it's just self-regulation. I think most publications have their editorial guidelines that they go by and they have like certain lines that they will not cross, right? And it's like, I won't publish this, we won't do this. And that's their editorial choice, right? So I think, you know, everybody has their own self-censorship, you know, like that's how I look at it. And I think for San Quentin News, we've always had like a mission and a vision of what we want to cover and why. So, for instance, we choose not to cover uh, prison riots because mm -hmm. prison riots are just like not in our vein of what we want to cover. Right. Everybody covers that. If you want to see a press release about a prison riot, you can get it from the official documentation or there's always somebody who's going to publish it in some other publication. Uh, our mission is more about like the rehabilitative efforts of the incarcerated, the programs that are happening, the things that highlight opportunity and also like public safety. So like in that regard, you know, we tread lightly on hearing like, you know, for instance, we get a lot of letters to the editor. Some of them are a lot of complaints and grievances that it's like, well, there's a way that you can go about that to remedy that without like throwing stones, you know, in a publication. And we're not going to weaponize the San Quentin News just so that somebody can get their voice out, right? Uh, when it comes to Sacramento, uh, particularly the Office of Public and Employee Communications, They've been very gracious and lenient with like what we would consider like, you know, uh, state parameters, right? It's like the they gave us like a clear slate on what we can do. And all they asked was like, hey, we just want you guys to be fair and giving us a chance to respond to something, you know, without you guys just like publishing something without asking our opinion or our, our official statement or stance on something. So we were free to do that. We did get into some hot water one time. I think you were still there when one of our writers wrote a story about High Desert State Prison. 
and it was like talking about a racist culture that had existed there and it was about a an inspector general report that had been written back in 1997 and we're talking about in 2018 when this story was written somebody had referred to that report in a news story and they were just saying that the culture had been a racist culture in High Desert State Prison. Somehow the writer mistook it as like, oh, it's a new report. It just came out. And we got in hot water because of that, because nobody checked the dates. Mm -hmm. Nobody had bothered to check the date. So there was, you know, not backlash, but there was like a conversation that we had to have about like, you can't just publish something. So the warden from High Desert actually came to talk to us about that and say like, dude, you could at least reach down. Like nobody sent me an email. Nobody had anybody call me. Nobody talked to the PIO either at San Quentin or at um, High Desert. And Lieutenant Sam Robinson, who approves all the media content and oversees it just to make sure that we don't step on no liability issues, because all media outlets, for the most part, have to have media insurance. So because we're an incarcerated run media uh, program and a project under, you know, like the state of California, we have to tread carefully on like not getting sued, because if we get sued, then it's the state who actually has to respond. So like, mm -hmm. I understand like the liability issue. So yeah, that's how we try to like navigate, you know, that issue. Right, right. Um, and um, and um, I, I see a question about where uh, you can find a back issue of San Quentin News. San Quentin has a website. Um, it's, I think it's actually a really, um, a little, an interesting little story about how you have a website. <coughs> Yeah, it's uh I mean it's great that we have like a digital website and that's because of the last mile. So, you know, San Quentin being probably the most progressive prison in, you know, the United States uh has given a lot of freedom to what kind of technologies are accessible to the incarcerated and what kind of programs are able to operate. So the last mile was started by uh Beverly uh, Parentini and Chris Redlitz. And basically they teach the guys how to code. And it mm -hmm. started at San Quentin and it has since spread to a bunch of other states. And our website is actually, you know, managed by the incarcerated inside of San Quentin as well. So they upload all our stories, you know, keep them on there and then update them every month. Uh, and they can, they are archived there. And they also have them at uh, the journalism school at Berkeley. Yeah. 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 And um, and and just so everybody knows, uh, it is extremely rare uh, for a for a prison newspaper to have a website. Um, I only know of one other uh, that has somebody on the outside, literally posting PDFs of their issues. Um, that's Mill Creek Post in Cal mm -hmm. in um, I own California that does that. Uh, mm -hmm. Most websites don't. And um, one of the things that we try to do at PJP is to make sure that we're amplifying those <laughs> newspapers as well. And um, so we do have a section um, called from prison newspapers where we uh, where we will uh, republish stories um, and 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 pay for them. Um, and uh, so, so they're online somewhere. Um, we're also about to launch um, what we're calling the Prison Newspaper Project. We have gone and done a survey of all existing prison newspapers. And um, you know, um, please um, sign up for our uh, news our, our um, newsletters to um, keep up on um, you know on on when we'll be announcing that. Um, and um, and San Quentin News has an awesome newsletter as well. And so that'll give you a great way to um, just uh, you know see what some of the best articles are. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So I see there's a question about that the archives go back to 2008. So the paper was uh, reinstated in 2008 after uh, being dormant for 20 years. But there are back issues dating back to the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. And then we have some issues from the 1940s. It's an 83-year-old newspaper now. So yeah. that's incredible. Huge legacy. Um, I also see a question. Can you discuss how participating in journalism has changed the lives of people <laughs> inside? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Jesse? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think for me, one of the main things, right, especially having grown up in the journalism guild, being taught by, you know, some award winning journalists, you know, uh, 
It was excellent just having that experience. And I think apart from teaching me the critical thinking skills and growing up with the guys uh, in my cohort, there was also the sense of purpose. You know, one of the things that happens when we become disenfranchised from our societies and separated from our families is that, you know, this sense of hopelessness and purposelessness, you know, seeps in, especially when you don't have a release date. So for a lot of the fellas in the newsroom, like the newspaper gave us purpose and a sense of belonging. Like all of a sudden we had a mission and a vision and something to actually strive for. Even though we didn't have release dates at the time, we actually had something you know, to look forward to every day because we got to speak on behalf of 136,000 incarcerated men and women in the state of California. And that was like, um, you know, great for just personal like value, you know, just having that value as an individual and being able to advocate for ourselves and for our community. And especially like for me, uh, one of the biggest things was just uh, recognizing my autonomy, like I have a choice. And number two, being able to take accountability, like being able to balance that. And then the other thing I would say that it benefited me a lot in terms of like my vocabulary. I still remember my first vocabulary word when we were writing that um, project about burning down a house, you know, and it's like there's a mm -hmm. difference between burn and being charred. Charred is like, you know, like more descriptive, right? So after that, I fell in love with just like buying a thesaurus. So I bought one. As uh, soon as I got home, as a matter of fact, I got it right next to me. Look. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Such a proud teacher moment. <laughs> um, so I um, I wanted to uh, answer that question, too. And, and um, you know, rather than hearing it from me, we've um, I just wanted to read something that a writer had sent to us recently. Um, this is uh, a writer named Tu Ka, who uh, is incarcerated at um, the um, in Corcoran. And um, and he said the following. PJP is continuing to give me an opportunity to be a part of something I never have dreamt of, a feeling of belonging to a writing community that encouraged and motivated me to become a better writer and journalist. My writing skills have matured. I've picked up a lot of new vocabulary and writing techniques through the correspondence program PJP provided. Um, before that, my life was dark and hopeless because I'm a lifer innate. Um, now I see a beacon of hope. And, and so, um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it, it's a lot of what 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 Jesse is um, is saying as well. Um, we also uh, one of the things that PJP does is that we work with writers uh, inside to uh, get stories co-published um, with mainstream publications. Um, we also work on collaborations, and we also help um, try and um, you know continue to do the work that I did with Jesse in getting his story published in the Post. And um, we've actually got one uh, coming out tomorrow in the New York Times, and uh, by uh, uh, a writer in. Um, in Idaho named Patrick Irving. And I asked him what he learned. And one of the things that he said is that, um, you know, he's, uh, that, that he's learned that he needs to add an extra level of scrutiny to the work that he submits. Um, because I was working in a bit of a rush, I missed necessary qualifiers and allowed old information to settle in my place. Um, as Mason, who is one of our editor, editors said in, in um, the revision process, things are always changing and this is why we fact check. That will be my motto, mo motto moving forward. And it's just, it's amazing to hear writers embrace the identity of, of journalist. And, um, you know, I've certainly felt that once we plant that idea, the, the nature of the stories start changing overnight, where uh, before they might have seen their story, their experiences just as their own experiences, um, they start to put um, context to the experiences as something that's more representative of a larger group of people. And, um, and um, it's, it's, it's so, you know, I, it, sometimes people uh, talk about what I do as if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing something out of the good of my heart. And it, and I just, I feel so privileged. I mean, I felt privileged working with you, Jesse, but I feel so privileged every day that that I get to I get to work with these stories and, and these writers. Um, and I know that at San Quentin, one of your challenges, uh, you have the happy problem that so many of the, you, you've, so many of the staff members are, are um, getting their sentences commuted and, and part, you know, pardoned and being recognized for the contributions that they've been, they've been making, right? 
Yeah, yeah, it's definitely great to have staff turnover in a newsroom that for the longest time had been like consistent, right? We had the same writers, same staff, same management for about nine years, and then most of us paroled. And that's a good that's a good place to be at, you know, just mm -hmm. getting people um, not just the recognition, right, but I think the validation, you know, that their work actually matters, that their stories and their voices are finally being heard. And that what they do for their community is also recognized by people who actually hold the keys to their release. So mm -hmm. it's um, it's amazing. I think journalism for for a lot of us, you know, especially I, I still go into the prison three times a week. So I still hear from the guys like how journalism, especially them being able to write and share stories of other men that are in prison. It's not just empowering. Right. But it's like you know, it gives them a sense of like, man, I'm doing something in spite of the senses that I have, you know, like I'm making a difference and I'm making an impact. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it shows. Yeah, no, for sure. And, um, you know, I think um, the guys at San Quentin News and 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 um, the alumni, as, as I like to think about them, um, are, are the North Star of, of um, you know, the possibilities of just um, as 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 a data point, um, you know, recidivism rates in this country, depending on who you who you ask or who's who's taking a survey, it's anywhere from sixty to eighty percent. Right um, at San Quentin News, the the recidivism rate among the alumni is zero. Yeah. So um, you know, if you're asking about how um, journalism has changed the lives, I mean, it, it's you know, it's. Um, Journal, you know, we talk about journalism as a dying industry and it's shrinking and, um, you know, the, the jobs are few and the poor is pay, but the the tools that it teaches you are are all things that that are valued in, in professional uh, development. And so it does. Um, I mean, what can you talk a little bit about what what the alums are doing, what they go yeah. on to do? Oh, for sure. For sure. So I think there's like, I, I always refer to the fact that like our 0% recidivism rate, right, would not be impressive if we were all just like barely getting by. Like it's not that it's it wouldn't that be in, um, that much of a big difference, right. But most of the guys that have come out of the media center, and you know, San Quentin News being one project of like everything that's going on there, but like everybody's either managing a nonprofit, doing like gun violence prevention, youth prevention programs, oh. youth diversion programs, um, Eddie's, you know, like doing bookkeeping mm -hmm. and photography on the side. We have guys producing uh, like film and uh, commercials and stuff for uh, nonprofits in the Bay Area so that they can, you know, have content to showcase. So most of our guys are actually like thriving in the community. Like they're mm -hmm. making a difference. And it's not just like they're making good money. It's like they're giving back. Like they came yeah. back and they're using this skill set to make a difference. I think it was you who told us that like th there's two components that are like most important in the story. And the reason why we use quotes is because people love people. And, you know, we've taken that concept, right? And just like continue to enforce it, right? And push it forward as like, yeah, we put people at the center of the stories because people are more important than statistics, numbers, and corrections numbers, mm -hmm. right? I'm more than my prison number. And everybody that we highlight in these stories, right? Like it's about that. So when we come out into the community, it's about making a difference and using those skill sets that, you know, we've learned in there it's transferable skills, you know, and just like mm -hmm. finding a way to like leverage that to give back to our communities. You know, some of the guys call it living amends where you mm -hmm. can't give back to, you know, uh, your survivors' families and stuff like that, right? Or the victims' families, but you can at least give back to the community, make a difference and hopefully change the trajectory of somebody's life by doing community-based storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, the the, the big event, um, recent or, you know, well, relatively recent event, of course, has been <laughs> COVID and um, PJP, uh, the Prison Journalism Project actually got its start during COVID, um, you know, really uh, because of um, all our friends in San Quentin. San Quentin was the site of one of the worst, probably the worst outbreak in a prison in the country. Mm -hmm. um, the the prison was under lockdown we weren't hearing anything and uh we you know me and, and my partner shaheen pasha who um who is over on the east coast um you know we just um 
we we felt like uh, you know we were in a historic moment. Um, it felt like we were about to make the same mistake um, we've made over and over again, which is that we are not um, including a voice of a of a community in in this historic historical record. And there was just news that we wanted to hear from inside. And so um, we started Prison Journalism Project. Um, we we um, put up a publication on Medium, put out a call through Prison Legal News, which is a widely read publication, and we just started getting flooded. And um, you know, two months later, George. Floyd was murdered and by the summer we just realized that how much journalism can be done inside even in prisons without any structure even when it's just one person um you know in a, in in solitary confinement or on death row or and you know um that there is still journalism that can be done that can that can um you know provide shed light in a way that can um you know shift public opinion um provide some context for criminal justice reform. And um, and so I just, um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about what it was like to be in that prison with, or, you know, not you, but, you know, for, for the staff to be in the prison with the worst outbreak, trying to put out a paper. Yeah, so initially um, we had a hard time just communicating because like you said, there was no phones, there was no communication other than through snail mail. And like the first, you know, uh, thing was just like, you know, there was a lot of fear. There was just like a lot of panic going on and stuff because, you know, it was just about survival. Like there was constantly, you know, man down when somebody was going out and like having to go to the hospital and stuff. So there was just like this hysteria that was taking place. And most folks inside, like they're just trying to survive. They're not really tripping on like, oh, we got to get the publication out even though like the editorial board knew like, hey, we got to get the paper out eventually. For us on the outside, it wasn't like a matter of like not being able to get it out. It was just like, okay, well, we don't have all the layout materials. We have all our designs inside. We hadn't anticipated, you know, a pandemic, you know, or a long-term <laughs> lockdown, right. right? Like those things don't happen at San Quinn, the flagship of rehabilitation. So it was like, we were all caught off guard uh, until um, Ali Tambora, and uh, he was a grant officer or program officer at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and they decided to come to the rescue and said, hey, like, we'll help fund an outside operation so that you guys can continue to put the paper out. So that mm -hmm. actually gave us some bandwidth and freed up, you know, some um, resources for us on the outside to be able to do that. And it was just like still a challenge because, you know, we're trying to put out a 20 page newspaper but we only have, you know, eight pages of content coming out because of snail mail. We can't wait because we're on deadline. It was like hard the first, you know, six months, but we had a good team of folks, you know, who came together and some resources and we were able to like start ramping up a little bit. And then we went back down and it just kept going over and over, right? For the next year and a half. I mean, it was extraordinary to see from the sidelines because, um, you know, the part that Jesse is not, not, um, being modest on behalf of the entire crew is that um, Ali Tempora is former former uh, one of the 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 um, key staff members who helped reboot San Quentin News, and then you had all these alumni that were out here that stepped in to do the work that they were doing inside. Um, Jonathan Chu was doing layout. Um, Wayne Boatwright, who was the managing editor, was doing. Um, was was doing uh, a lot of the uh, writing some stories too, right? I mean, who else am I? Who else am I forgetting? And yeah, you know, Javier, the advisors, of yeah. course. Yeah, Javier, Eddie, myself, Miguel Quesada. Like we were all functioning in different roles, like the same roles we managed on the inside at times. Uh, whether it was layout, managing editor, like I had a function as managing editor sometimes. Uh, Jonathan Chu was doing layout, and uh, uh, Javier and uh, Kenny Brighton. They were all pulling source material, just like the Berkeley students, because even UC Berkeley wasn't going to school. Like during right, the pandemic, right, it right. was all online, so we didn't have our volunteer base, our mm -hmm. advisors, you know, they were um, doing the best that they could. But operating like four Google Docs open at the same time is kind of tricky, you know, <laughs> and tech is just one of those things that like it was great, you know, to like go through that experience just because like we knew coming out of it that we were a lot stronger just because we had uh, outside infrastructure and we had developed some systems. But building those capacities out here after like we had spent so many years inside of prison was another learning curve for us as well. So 
you know, I wasn't grateful for the pandemic, but I'm grateful for the learnings that came out of it. Yeah, I mean, we, um, you know, we were in a little bit of a different situation because, you know, we started in the pandemic um, mm -hmm. and, um, but, um, you know, just trying to figure out how you do journalism um, via letters and, uh, and, um, and all that jazz was, was um, quite the experience. We, you know, our whole uh, prison journalism project's whole volunteer program came out of the pandemic because we mm -hmm. actually found that students who weren't working, um, you know, professionals that were working from home um, had the time to give a little bit. And so, um, you know, that's, that's been amazing for us. Um, Greg, did you want to switch over to questions or um, should we just keep on talking? If you both want to keep on talking, I think people are liking it. So All right. I think, I mean, my, my, you know, it's like, I've got a couple of, like, I do have some things that maybe I could ask, but like, I'm not seeing a lot of the chat right now. Uh, oh, there's stuff in the Q&A though. Um, how did prison authorities respond to increased scrutiny during the pandemic? Did they make it more difficult for the press or incarcerated writers to illuminate the conditions of what was going on? Uh, so I think on, on that note, right, like that's probably like the biggest silver lining in terms of like the pandemic. Like all of a sudden there was too many eyes looking at what was happening inside of the institutions and there was no way for it to be ignored. So now, like, whether they liked it or not, they had to address, you know, the elephant in the room. And for the longest time, like, there hasn't been that much press interest and coverage of the prison system as during the pandemic. Like, for the most part, you know, when you go to prison, and I'll speak, you know, in the first person, not as executive director, but as Jesse Vasquez, right? So going to prison, right, was one of the, you know, probably the worst experience, right, and the best in my life. But it was also like where you learned like who actually cares, right? For the most part, mm -hmm. prisoners are relegated as the low hanging fruit during political elections. We're the ones that can be discarded easily. We're the scapegoats, you know, that everybody uses when they need a cheap vote and they want to get, you know, reelected. And we're also like the ones that are easily forgotten, you know, when it comes to like the big movements and the big pushes. Every policy that has ever been passed about prisons and prisoners never takes into consideration the people that it actually impacts. Right, right. So when COVID hit, all of a sudden, everybody cares, right? Because people are dying and death attracts people and death attracted news to San Quentin in a way that it had never had before. And all of a sudden, prisons everywhere had to pay attention to like, oh, we can't just like sweep 20 bodies under the rug. And it took the death of a lot of human beings, you know, to like draw this national press coverage to the prison system. So all of a sudden, like the press secretaries and press offices had to open up the doors to everybody. So that's the silver lining of COVID in the California Department of Corrections and probably Department of Corrections across the nation, where they couldn't just like say, oh, no comment, penological interest, we can't say anything. You got to say something because this is a public health crisis and you have to address it. I have to tell you, Jesse, there are too many prisons that um, still will not comment. So, um, I mean, it's just, you know, the more we learn and the more we experience what, um, you know, what systems and um, are like in different states, you know, Florida, New Jersey, places like that. Um, you know, it's it's kind of incredible that that um, you know San Quentin News. Um, I mean, you guys have an incredible team, but you you know it's it's and it's weird to say that, right? I mean, I, it's weird for me to hear hear you say, you know, prison was the worst and best experience of your life. But at the same time, I think, you know, one of the stories um, that we've published that I think about a lot is um, we have a we have a writer at San Quentin who was on death row and um, he first got our attention because he wrote a story about um, what it was like to live side by side with death and how he took inspiration for the Japanese samurai. Um, and um, and then um, about, um, I don't know, 10 months later, he sent another story and he said that, um, you know, he he's been um, he's been chosen as part of a, a pilot program that allows death row uh, prisoners to go into the main population. 
and he knows that it's good for him and that he 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 knows that he has to do it but how um the thought of leaving death row makes him homesick uh, because he has been in death row until uh, since he was 20 years old he's now in his late 40s it's the only adult life he's known and he's built a community for himself and it just like it still blows me away you know, um, and and I think there's so many nuances and intricacies and stories and um, that that, you know, I mean, I'm sure that everybody here in the room knows that there's no way that that the stereo, you know, they, that that people's individuals experiences can be stereotyped or that a community with nearly two million people inside um, across the country can be um, stereotyped. But, um, you know, it's. Um, where I, th I think, you know, both of our, our organizations together and, and other great ones, I mean, we're, we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of um, you know, the, the stories that need to come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want to note, uh, I'm seeing someone in the chat say that they worked at San Quentin TV. So that's exciting to see that somebody was able to find out about our program and join us here. Thanks for coming. Um, so uh, Yael asks, Maybe this can work. I guess this could work for San Quentin or for PJP too. Uh, how how new writers find the paper, or how the paper finds them, and how they get onboarded. Like, what's the process for training people and and for people that may not have been journalists beforehand? So, how do people find San Quentin News, or how do people find PJP, or how do you find them? Well, you're asking the right people. <laughs> yes. you want exactly. To, you want to go first, Jesse. Yeah, for sure. So, San Quentin News Media Center is like right in the middle of the yard. Like, you can find it in the corner of the education building. Everybody is welcome to apply for the Journalism Guild. Uh, and in the Journalism Guild, that's like where we get our farm team from. Uh, that's where we pick our writers from. And it all depends on, you know, there's a couple of things that we look for in our writers or future staff. Uh, anybody can write for the paper. We accept any submission from any state uh, prison inside of California, even outside. We'll take some submissions, but we haven't gotten too many. Uh, but for the most part, uh, everybody can write for the paper as long as, you know, it meets the editorial guidelines. And then it, it, when it comes to staff, that's where it gets, you know, like uh, tricky because we only have like 18 slots. And, you know, we want to make sure that, like, it's a good fit for the team, it's a good fit for the advisors, uh, that there's potential. You know, we always look for, when I was editor-in-chief, and I always tell folks, like, it was probably the golden era, because, you know, every mm -hmm. leader thinks that it's his golden era. So when, uh, when I was editor-in-chief there, we had our process of, like, okay, we want to evaluate character, potential, and fit. So you can teach people how to write, you know, if you have the right teachers in a room. But one thing that you want for people that are going to be long term living in a fishbowl and reporting on their community, you want to have somebody with upright character. You can't have somebody who has, you know, uh, shady characteristics, who can't be trusted, who's going to twist people's words or misquote them or try and find people that think like minded like him just because he wants to make a story of out of something. So character was the main thing that we looked for. Potential was like, okay, do they have the skill sets that we can actually get uh, crafted? And can he be honed? And can he be groomed? And is he going to be a good fit was the third, because we have a lot of volunteers that come in, both men and women, and a lot of Berkeley students every semester, thanks to UC Berkeley professor uh, Bill Drummond, who's been generous for the past, uh, I don't know, 10 years. 10 11. years. <laughs> yeah, you know, so he's been bringing in students for a long time. So we want to be mindful of like, you know, people's comfort zones and, you know, being able to know that like who's in the newsroom is somebody who can be trusted, not just with people's words, but with people's presence. And I remember, I mean, you guys talked about that when I was there and it just left such an impression on me. Um, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about here is about, um, you know, is is the fact that San Quentin News is one of the most integrated places inside prison where so much is governed or, you know, by by race. And um, and if you were wondering, Jesse's um awesome article in the Washington Post was was the personal take on that and how um, <clears throat> how how San Quentin taught him um, 
well taught you race relations, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the names that we haven't mentioned yet is um, Richard Richardson Bonnaroo, who uh, was your predecessor um, as editor in chief, and um, and 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 the friendship that you guys had. Um, you know, um, and and then um, with respect to uh, prison journalism project, I mean, war travels really quickly. I mean, we started out with prison legal news. We have a lot of prison programs and education programs that that help send word in. We have a submissions um, uh, packet that we send out to writers who want to write for us. And um, we also have our own newspaper. We have a newspaper, an instructional newspaper called PJP Inside, that's primarily for our for incarcerated people. It, um, it, it has our best stories uh, with little blurbs on why we chose them. And we have um, a couple pages um, called um, Learn and um, where we'll annotate a story, we'll break it down, we'll explain how this story got to put together and we'll also share some other, um, you know, instructional um, uh, information as well. And so um, that has been, um, really great in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been very well received. It's, it's fun. You know, it's interesting to read. It's helpful. It's instructional. And uh, we, we, we get requests all the time for them. Um, and so, um, you know, and Greg, maybe we'll send you some um, issues or get you on our list as well. So um, you can um, maybe uh, have them along with all these other um, awesome inside publications. Yeah. That'd be um, great. Yeah, um, I um, and I just you know we while we talk about this and how it takes so many organizations to to move the needle, I I mean I think I think we would both love to give shout outs to some of our our friends who are working in this space too. I mean, um, Empowerment Avenue, which is run by um, Rasan Thomas, who some of you might know from Ear Hustle, um, he used to be on San Quentin uh, a, a San Quentin News um, staffer as well, right, Bessie? Yeah, yeah, he was our sports writer. Yeah, I'm in, I'm incredibly impressed and proud of uh, Rasan Thomas and Emily Noko, his uh, yeah. co-director. You know, who's uh, started that uh, project. Yeah, and um, you know, Pen America has always had a great criminal justice program, but but um, our friends, I think our mutual friends there, are doing great work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think you know, it's. Um, it's it's you know the U.S. the U.S. prison system is is the most broken system um, in the world. Uh, you know um, you know we like to talk about about um, the statistic that uh, America the U.S. has about uh, twenty percent of the world's population and about um, uh, no 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 sorry am I doing am I going the, it's about four percent of the world's population and sixteen percent of the world's incarcerated population. Uh, which is just insane. We're 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 right down there with Rwanda, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's and definitely a daunting number. <clears throat> um, well, Jesse, uh, this is Gregory. Uh, wondering for for like families, the people on the outside. What what does the paper mean for them? Like, do do, do they get sent the paper and and get to write you guys and? Yeah, they do. They do. So a lot of the families that get uh, subscriptions um, either through our website or, you know, the uh, print version, uh, we get a lot of fan mail, uh, maybe about, you know, 100 pieces of mail every month, you know, from families and the incarcerated, about, you know, 60 of them are from the incarcerated and then the rest from families. I look at all the social media posts uh, from the families and things like that. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways during COVID, unfortunately, was, you know, the fact that we lost 29 individuals at San Quentin, 28 incarcerated men, one uh, correctional sergeant, and two of the family members of the men that passed away, they were happy to have had uh, pictures and stories of their loved ones, either in the runner's club or in their graduation from Mount Tamapayas College, which is the only college accredited inside of a prison system. And it was like very heartbreaking to know that like these individuals have been incarcerated for one was 23 years and the other one was about 31. And like they had passed from COVID inside of the prison system and the fondest best memories that their families would have were recorded inside of San Quentin News. Like they would not be remembered for the worst mistake that they made in their life. 
they would be remembered for their graduation and them completing the marathon with the Thousand Mile Club at San Quentin. And I think that speaks volumes to the fact that like sometimes the stories that go unnoticed and untold in mainstream media, those have significance for the family members of the people that don't often get a chance to tell their side of the story. You know, in the in the U.S. prison system, like the incarcerated don't actually have a voice inside of the courtroom because their attorneys have to speak on their behalf. They don't get to tell their version of the tale, you know, because it's incriminating. Uh, they don't get to share anything at sentencing. The only time they get to tell their story is either before a parole board or the day of their execution when they get to apologize. And that is one of the things that's like very disheartening because the only time you actually get to tell your story is either on your own platform like San Quentin News or through a project like Prison Journalism Project where you actually get recognized as a human being and get to tell your story. I mean, one of the things that <clears throat> we, um, our formerly incarcerated friends had pointed out about our site was that uh, we provide a profile page for any writer who has submitted, um, who, who we published at least one story. And the first thing he, you know, and he was really blown away by that. And the first thing he said was, you know, you know, when people search uh, for their names in, in Google, um, you know, for the first time, it, it they can um the the google search can be populated by the stuff that they've done not the not what they've um you know you know the the mis the worst mistakes of their lives um and um you know that's um you know it's it's um yeah i mean it's it it it's great that we can do that um i see the other question here about articles resulting in fair prison rules yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we've been doing in the past year is collecting a lot of data points, you know, to like show our, you know, like metrics of success and impact. And we've been able to at least notice that there's been a couple of changes, not for like fair prison uh, rules, uh, like administrative rules, but just in terms of influencing policy within the state of California and in particular, within the practices of particular uh, district attorney's offices. So because of the San Quentin News, we've been having uh, like public forums with district attorneys, public defenders, uh, law enforcement agencies and things like that. And we've, you know, helped them like recognize that they've had to change certain policies and practices just in terms of like how they treat people, you know, whether it's at the time of arrest, before sentencing, you know, or during the uh, trial phase of the process. And then within the California Department of Corrections, I think we've actually influenced how they actually treat incarcerated run media projects because they hadn't had a manual to like deal with like incarcerated run or incarcerated produced content until the San Quentin Media Center. So all yeah. of a sudden they had to like take notice of something. Yeah, I, uh, if I could just squeeze in a quick um, short one as well. Um, this is not in California, but one of our, um, you know, a direct example of, of the impact that a story can make is that we had our, we have a correspondent in New Jersey at New Jersey State Prison. Uh, when he started working for us, all of his mail was stopped in both directions. Um, it didn't matter if we we um, sent them registered. Um, he what you know, it, the records would show that it was received at the prison. He never got them, and that was that went on for about a year and a half. And then he published a story in uh, the New Jersey Start Leisure about the Omicron outbreak earlier this year. And um, and state legislators took notice and all of a sudden um, they went in, they wanted to, to look into what was going on at New Jersey State Prison. His mail resumed miraculously. And um, and the next thing you know, he was asked to teach a class using our materials. And so, you know, it, it you know, it can have broad impact, like, um, you know, the, the examples that Jesse, Jesse shared, and it can, you know, it, it can have direct impact, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, you're on mute. I'm muted. Of course I am. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very easiest sin of, of Zoom. Um, I want to thank you, Kari and Jesse, for an amazing program. This was this was a real treat to have you both here today. And I think people learned a lot. Um, I know I certainly did. And I mean, if you, if you have any last thoughts, please feel free to say them. Or you can see in the chat that people are, you know, saying a, a lot of great things and, and thank you. 
Well, I mean, the one last thing that we, we would love to do is that today actually kicks off uh, both of our organization's two month, um, you know, end of year fundraising campaign. Um, uh, it's um, it's we're both uh, part of a, a nonprofit independent news organization that 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 does this coordinated campaign. And so um, if you do um, have anything to spare and, and could support our work, uh, we would be so grateful if you don't. We would be so grateful for um, you know signing up for our newsletters and sharing um, the stories with with our writers and um, and I just wanted to give one um, shout out to um, one organization that 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 I missed um, and is um, that that I um, think is doing great work, which is Humans of San Quentin, and that was started by um, Juan Haynes, who is about to come out, right, Jesse? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you know another star, uh, star yeah. <laughs> soon to be San Quentin News alum. Yeah, yeah. And let's not forget the Marshall Project with the Lawrence. Marshall Project, of yeah. course, of yeah. course. Uh, Lawrence um, is one of our board members, um, or and um, as is Bill Keller, and um, and they, you know, they've they've always been leading the way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming today and, and speaking to us. Again, it's a real treat. Yeah. All right, thank you everybody for coming. We are gonna, uh, for those of you that wanna have the video later, it'll we'll send that out in the next couple of days. And yeah, please yeah. check the calendar. There's other programs coming up. You know, if you wanna join for that Ear Hustle program on Thursday, uh, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of ways you can show up in person for it. So. I can't wait for that book. Yeah. yeah. Um, right, well, thank oh. you. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, thank you for thank all you, you do for, as a volunteer as well yeah. for us. Um, and Jesse, I'll catch you soon. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye.